right, welcome to the fifth slideshow for Victory Garden. Um, told you I had June wrapped up, but apparently half the photos from June 29th didn't make it into uh, my workflow, so I neglected to show you all of the pictures of storm damage that we had, which sort of plays a um, major role in the upcoming pictures from July. So we're going to jump back to the 29th of June and show you some of the storm damage. Uh, this first image is showing you uh, the lower pond, the larger pond, completely filled up with water. Again, remember it's it's very shallow beyond on this the end route where you don't see any plants. It's actually uh, a couple feet deep, which isn't very deep, but it's deep enough to keep plants from growing uh, successfully. On the, you can see on the left-hand side, it's just covered in ragweed and a few other species. Uh, glad that they're there because they slowed down a lot of the mulch that was trying to escape our system with these torrential rains we were getting. But it wasn't necessarily the rains that was the major problem with this storm. Uh, I had talked about straight line winds. Uh, look at the top portion of this screen. You can see a corn plant lying horizontal, other plants just strewn all over the place. This is a combination of wind and water. When you have 60 mile an hour winds, that's uh, 96 kilometers an hour, rolling through your property, uh, you're going to have damage. Remember I had said that we transplanted this corn out and had totally screwed up its uh, life cycle. Well, you know, I guess it didn't really matter because I can't control the weather. And what happened was a major storm came in and knocked them down regardless. So starting out from seed, starting... Uh, them in a tray and transplanting them on accident, well, uh, you know, it all worked out the same in the end. Uh, down the center of this screen, you can see where water has dug a channel along one of our double dug beds. On the right side of the screen, uh, this is a compacted soil that we were using, just the normal lawn that we had mulched with pine straw to operate as a path. That was so impenetrable that it just went off to the side and then dug right along where the weak spot was, washed away soil, compost, and mulch along with parts of plants. And we're going to see a close-up picture here. You can see one of the corn uh, plants on the right just splayed out. Uh, you can see how the soil was being protected by a nice layer of mulch uh, in a normal rain, but what happened is Remember how I built that swale, dug that swale uh, off contour because I totally screwed it up? Well, with all the water that pools at the elbow where that huge comfrey plant's growing, uh, if we get enough rain, at least in 2011 before I did some uh, you know, mitigation uh, efforts, uh, we would have a potential of the berm overflowing. It overflowed and then just washed away. And this was just probably, I think this was the first storm of three or four that we had. We had at least, I would say probably three storms with straight line winds. Uh, you know, one is bad enough, and then when you have them followed up by another and another, this is what you end up with. Uh, this photo obviously zoomed out a little bit, showing you part of the Four Sisters Guild, just decimation. Um, there's no other way to say it, but our corn was completely wiped out. Tap roots or no tap roots, 60 mile an hour winds are going to destroy your plants a little bit closer, uh, horizontal, nothing, no support for the beans to grow up. Uh, but it did fill up the pond. <laughs> here's, here's the first pond. Uh, it's a lot cleaner than the other pond was, and that's because it didn't have this channel dug uh, along a pathway and bringing all the dirt in. So this uh, it still had a lot of mulch. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen where there's a you can't really see a nice reflection that's because of all this mulch that washed down and on into the pond um, but good good uh, good rain filled the swales up but did a little bit of damage here's a picture of the lower pond with some of the mulch uh, being stopped by these plants and you know just to show you the power of this storm you know these photos were taken uh, probably 10 30 11 o'clock in the morning I could take a look and see when they were but uh, you know, it was, it was before noon, and the rain had come through the night. Well, look at the, how the grass has been bent down to uh, you know ground level from this torrential rain. This is, and this is what would happen on an even larger scale uh, before we did any earthworks, before we were trying to slow down any water, before there was any real vegetation, uh, before the ponds were there, and this would just our entire backyard that 
runs alongside that berm where the water's going to run would look like this. And think of the thousands of gallons that we must have lost during this rain event because of uh, this rainstorm. Um, you know, here's, here's just another picture of some cucumbers. Uh, I, like, I like cucumbers and dangling down off of our uh, trellis there, hanging out over the pond. Uh, just an interesting photograph. Um, this one here, not, not so good. Remember, my photography skills are terrible, uh, so the exposure on this is just garbage. But uh, you, know, you remember how I was talking about in the last podcast using wood mulch and how it would take a serious rainfall in order to uh, percolate down through the wood and into your soil. And this is what I was talking about, the sun coming back out and um, just evaporating all the, va all the moisture from your wood mulch, the top layer of your wood mulch. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, just this picture, you can definitely tell how bright it is outside. 30 degrees north uh, during the summer gets pretty bright. So let's jump on to... July to see what kind of effects this had. This photo is not going to show you much. This is just some uh, seed balls. Uh, see, you hear a lot of people talking about seed balls in permaculture. Uh, we we didn't do uh, different types of seeds in this seed ball. We just did like one type of plant per uh, individual, and this makes it a lot easier uh, when you're out planting a lot of seeds uh, and you're having to switch back and forth between different species, and you're trying to do a polyculture. I find it's a lot easier to maneuver. I mean, sure, you can't tell uh, which is which. Besides, see, we had this tobacco in the bottom right-hand corner. They're they're a lot smaller, and then sunflowers were bigger. And you can vary the size of your seed, your little seed ball. But the the nice thing about planting this way is that you're giving a plant a very low uh, dose of fertilizer, but you're giving it microorganisms. So we'd mix in with the compost, with the potting soil, with a little bit of clay we would drop in uh, some of that endomycorrhizal fungi. So right off the bat, the plants are going to have uh, a host of beneficial organisms to help them out along the way. So that was the 2nd of July. Then we're going to go to the 6th of July. Uh, a little bit of a harvest here. Uh, egg, you know, eggplant, um, sun gold cherry tomatoes, jalapeno peppers, banana peppers. Uh, just a really tiny harvest. Just showing you what we could bring in. Uh, if you just stepped out to the garden for a few seconds and wanted to bring something in for lunch or dinner or what have you, as you can see in this photo, a heck of a lot more sun gold cherry tomatoes coming online. Um, this whole guild fared so much better from the wind for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's not in direct line with uh, the entire breadth of the uh, backyard. Um, grandmother's addition is like a huge windbreak for this section of the garden but once you get down past that second swale and you look uh, west from this fence here because this is running along the east side of our fence if you look west you can look all the way to the other end of the property and then from there it's just you know a privacy fence so 60 mile an hour winds can just blow right on through there and gain speed whereas this is protected a little bit uh, basil in the center there uh, crowned with tomatoes, and there's Mexican tarragon, bottom left-hand corner. It, the base of it's coming up from some stones. In between those stones is a cilantro plant that's going to seed. There's a, some peppers in here. Um, again, all, all of it would have done better if there were less tomato plants, uh, but it was our most successful of the two. Not really counting the green gilks, we didn't get a lot of production from it. There were some sunflowers that survived the winds, Here's a uh, sunflower looking like it's beginning to open up. Corn damaged not only from the winds, but uh, not having health, not really fertile and healthy soil to grow in initially, or not having those beneficial insects that got decimated by uh, all different types of bugs. We, of course, we didn't spray or anything. I mean, if you're going to lose your crop, don't get all vengeful and decide you're going to spray shit all over it and try to kill everything. It just doesn't make any sense. If you lose it, that's nature telling you you did it wrong in the first place. So learn from it and just enjoy the fact that the plants did produce some biomass for you uh, and learn from the mistake and go on from there. I know everybody who's listening to this is probably doing permaculture and wouldn't spray anyway, but I have to get that off my chest every once in a while. Um, moving on to the next day, this is the 7th. We're looking at some tomatoes, comfrey, uh, 
blueberries, and a whole lot of cosmos. It's on the berm extension. Uh, this is that southwestern facing raised bed that I built. Uh, really hard to tell that there are blueberries in here, but there are a couple blueberry plants that survived. They look a whole lot healthier this year, 2012, than they did in 2011. All the blueberry plants are just getting over their shock from being dug up and then transported and uh, you know planted out into really terrible soil. The cosmos, of course, just it grows wherever the heck we put it. As long as it had a little bit of sun, it grew. Uh, these tomatoes came up through the mulch. Uh, just yeah, tomato seeds are really hard to kill. You better if you're going to compost tomatoes and you don't want tomatoes to volunteer wherever the heck you put them, then either a you better live in a cold climate that's going to do those seeds in, or b you're going to have to get it really hot because tomatoes just popped up wherever we had compost from the city, which is kind of cool because. We love tomatoes, and tomatoes that volunteer like this are very hardy. We almost never watered them. We sure we give them some compost tea every once in a while as a drench, uh, but we do that to every single plant. Um, this actually turned into sort of a tomato patch for my grandma. Here's a close-up one of the cosmos being fed on by either some solitary bees or maybe some kind of wasp. But uh, it's a really pretty plant. I really like the cosmos uh, in terms of the color, but it's just so aggressive. Another photo of the four sisters. Um, you know, you can tell in this it hasn't recovered since uh, the week, a little over a week ago, when I showed you those pictures from the end of June. <clears throat> but the some of the the squash, a lot of the squash plants survived. A lot of them didn't. A lot of them snapped. A lot of them at the base snapped. We had 60 mile an hour winds again. But the the cantaloupes and watermelons survived, and. Uh, and, and some of the, there's one sunflower there at sort of the center of the screen. Uh, I know everything's almost the same shade of green in this photo, but you can see a really massive sunflower there. A little bit closer, uh, some of the corn, you know, trying to get back up. At first we staked, we tried to mound them again, and then we would, then we staked them. By the time the third storm came, we said, screw this, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to do anything. Uh, but look at look at all the comp look at the beans. You can see some beans here. If you look dead center, and then you bring your eyes about halfway to the left hand side of the screen, these trifolate leaves here. These are massive beans. These beans are just so healthy, and it's a shame they didn't have anything more than a couple of sunflowers to grow up. And by the time uh, there are only a few sunflowers left, you've got. Remember, we planted four beans, one bean for every single corn plant on every single mound. And you're looking at eight to ten corn mounds here that are gone. So there's 30 plus <laughs> bean plants here uh, fixing nitrogen and trying to find some place to grow, competing with the uh, melons. Just, just a mess. Just an awful mess. And here's here's some melons doing well. And if you look closely, you can also see some morning glories that are starting to go. We I new to gardening that was dumb I didn't realize what the difference between beans and morning glories were I should have been killing these morning glories because morning glories are just the most ruinous plant in the garden I thought I didn't like cosmos but morning glories are right up there with poison ivy in my book and you'll see why once we get to September here's an area of the garden that fared really well through the storms because it's the green guild and it's right uh, by the house and it's protected by the house and the deck so wind damage is not necessarily a big issue here. Look at the um, how, how tall the lettuce gets when it's going to uh, go to seed. You can see some of it on the right-hand side of the screen uh, is beginning to make flower heads. And the sunflowers are looking good. There's an onion here in the, in the foreground, more onions in the background. Uh, comfrey creeping into this picture as well. And, of course, the cosmos. I mean, the cosmos is just ubiquitous and uh, serving serving its purpose and there's a bumblebee at the top center of flying around so we're we're doing good things uh, here's another photo I just jumped up on the air conditioning units and took this picture uh, you can see in the areas at the bottom right hand corner of the screen this is the part that gets a lot more shade and, and look at the height difference in the lettuce um, between that and the what's on the left hand side. Look how thick the 
the tomatoes in the nightshade area are growing and this is when I wish that my computer was capable of doing screencasts not overloading itself because a lot of these pictures even though they don't look too great if I were a if I was able to zoom in and uh, sh you know navigate these with you you would be able to see in the dead center of the screen there's uh, crimson clover that has dried out seeds there's a few flowers left there's red clover coming on there's, and it's right next to a huge sweet Genovese basil plant that is pumping out flowers. Uh, I'm counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, at least 60 large uh, like beef size tomatoes. And I won't even try to count the cherry tomatoes on the right hand side of the screen. So this is one of the reasons why I did invest in a, a fairly nice camera. Um, a Pentax K7, they don't make it anymore, but it's a weather sealed camera, so really rugged, and you can bring it out in the uh, rain and the cold, and it's just going to take up with a whole lot of abuse. But these pictures are excellent. Um, you know, you may not be getting a lot from these slideshows, but my the ability for me to go back through time and see what we did and actually have a photographic record that's detailed like this uh, is really important. I really would suggest that if it's in, within your budget to uh, invest in a camera and take these pictures and share them with people like I am. Let's move on. Uh, here's more. Of the, remember I said cherry tomatoes. These are sun gold cherries that just would not stop producing. Um, again, I, I won't try to count how many are here, but this was the story all the way through September, and I think a couple of them may have lived into October. Uh, so... <laughs> I pity anyone who buys tomatoes during the summer and has the ability to do this. You know, not everybody's got a half acre yard uh, that they can convert to a permaculture system, but quite a few people in the States do and they choose to have lawns instead. Here's a closer picture of uh, one of the polycultures there in the Nightshade Guild on the left hand side of the screen clipped is a tomato, to the right of it some parsley. Uh, to the right of this little wall of stones is a jalapeno pepper plant moving bottom right from there. It's out of focus, but that's a uh, white dotted mint, which is a member of the bee balm family, if I'm not mistaken, native to our region. And you can use it for uh, tea. And of course, it's just going to produce an immense amount of flowers coming in its second year. And clipped on the bottom right hand corner of the screen is uh, a bell pepper and then of course there's a big tomato here in the back. And actually between the parsley and the jalapeno pepper, which is the uh, center left, there's uh, you can see one of these morning glories beginning to do its uh, dirty work there. And if you're kind of wondering what the stones are for, we don't have a lot of dark colored stones that came out when we were double digging. We had a lot of these light colored stones. Uh, so I... You know, I thought, well, instead of just having them sit around in a pile, if I put them between the plants, perhaps, maybe, it would help reflect some of the sunlight onto these peppers and everything else. Not sure if it did, but it's kind of neat. Uh, let's go to the 17th, and I'm going to do a little bit of a rant right now. Um, obviously, this is the Green Guild with sunflowers that have opened looking absolutely gorgeous on the left side of the screen you can actually see uh, a lot better now that uh, large basil plant with its companion of uh, tomatoes and crimson clover red clover our neighbor's yard um, you know uh, this may not seem if you if you've been watching a lot of permaculture stuff this is not the most interesting garden you've ever seen. This isn't, I'm not doing anything amazing. I'm not uh, producing something that's just out of this world. My gosh, I need to mimic what this guy is doing. Um, but you have to understand that what we're doing, at least in the States, and I know in a lot of other developed countries, but especially the States, this is a really radical idea. Uh, to take your lawn and turn it into a garden uh, you know, that hasn't happened since the Second World War when we were rationing food and everyday consumer supplies. Uh, gardening in, in America is something that's uh, either a hobby, like you like making your own salsa, or you just love having a couple tomato plants. It's gardening, 
usually isn't something that the middle class is going to look to because gardening tells people that you can't afford food. That's not what everybody believes, but that's a really dominant idea in the society is that people who are too poor to buy food grow food. Uh, growing foods beneath them. It's why we moved out of the cities. You know, we want lawns. Lawns are a status symbol that I know many of you know this, that uh, lawns came out of uh, feudal England and France where the landlords and then the, and then the merchants as they increased in their wealth uh, could show people that, hey, I have enough money that I can buy my food. I don't have to grow anything. Look at my grass. I can waste the most precious resource we have and grow something that nobody's going to use. Besides, at least they ran sheep on their grass. We run lawn mowers that burn fossil fuels. And if you're lucky, you're running a electric lawn mower, but that's burning fossil fuels in the power plant. Uh, flans are also a symbol that tell people everything is okay. Uh, that's why a lot of subdivisions have these codes where if your lawns are a certain height then you get fined uh, sometimes hundreds of dollars uh, you can even be evicted in some neighborhoods for you know not having a lawn so by telling everybody that by maintaining a lawn especially in your front yard by maintaining a beautiful green lawn uh, that's well kept and you're out there every week mowing it. It tells everybody that everything's a-okay in your household. Nothing to see here. Move on. Don't be nosy. As soon as the grass gets longer, people start wondering, I wonder why they didn't grow their grass, uh, cut their grass this week. Why aren't they out there manicuring this? Something must be wrong. And if it gets even higher, then it looks like it's abandoned. And then people start getting really pissed off. Um, so this is one reason why we're doing it in the backyard. Uh, you know, it... It takes an act of courage to do it in your front yard, and I, I would encourage people that if they're going to do this, start off in your backyard, learn, uh, make your mistakes where people aren't going to readily see them and ridicule them, and then when you're ready, move to your front yard and just wow them and blow them out of the water. Uh, this is, that's a cultural paradigm that needs to see an untimely death because everything's not okay. Uh, we can't afford real food anymore, and for people to tell me, that that green lawn is more beautiful than my diverse ecosystem that we're setting up that's going to be feeding us, feeding wildlife, and perpetuating a system of regeneration versus depletion. That mine is ugly, mine is disgusting, and mine needs to be chopped down and sprayed with Monsanto products, and theirs can stay. Um, you know, that's just not the case anymore. And I'm going to end my rant there before I go crazy. Let's look at the... Four Sisters again, which has now become the sea of green. Uh, look at these beans. Look at the beans just growing all over these sunflowers that are uh, managing to recover. I love sunflowers because they're just such strong plants. They can take having... Look at this one in the bottom left-hand corner just covered in beans. It's still trying to grow and uh, flower for us. Uh, here, let me look, look at this. Look at these weeds that are growing all over the place. And what they're doing is they're structuring the soil. They're creating niche habitat environments for different types of insects and animals. They are slowing water down from leaving our property. They're increasing biomass. They're collecting the solar energy that we're blessed to have. You know, why people, you know, send a bank, you know, hundreds to thousands and thousands of dollars every single month to have land and then grow something that they're not even going to use uh, is, is just astounding to me. And again, this is another one of those pictures I wish I could zoom in and show you, uh, you know, just the scale of the garden. You know, you've got the four sisters if you look straight back to where the, uh, the bird feeders are. And then to the right, you can even see uh, the bamboo poles that are holding up our tomato plants. Um, you know, this this project really uh, just pumping out beauty and nutrition and uh, optimism really for you know the future of this site and our family. Here's another picture of some of those water hyacinth plants. We moved some to the larger pond. Uh, you know, remember that just you know a few weeks ago, you know this is the 17th. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, this was completely full of water, and now it's down. 
you know, a couple of feet. The, the water hyacinth here is flowering. A lot of people keep it because it is beautiful and it flowers. But this is the point uh, when we probably even should have gotten to them a day before and chopped these flowers off. And, and so we did, uh, you know, trying to produce biomass. Excuse me, not trying to uh, allow this to escape into uh, the wild. Here's a picture of one of the blueberry mounds that's inside the fence. Uh, we've got tomatoes volunteering. A uh, couple, two of the blueberry plants survived. Uh, the other two uh, died. There's a lemon balm here, but it's being covered up by a tomato. Uh, Left-hand side of the screen, in the back, you can see that the mounds are being uh, raised a little bit taller. Uh, that's where some new dirt's been laid. And then in the back where I haven't, you know, uh, the seed bank that's in that soil has cropped up. Uh, you know, seeds are amazing things. I think withstand so many different uh, environmental conditions and, and just continue to wait, lie in wait for the perfect opportunity to come up. Uh, you know, again, oh, you've seen this same angle quite a few times now of the, the remnants of the four sisters, but you can see my that, that plastic lawn chair again that I'm using just to sit and observe. I mean, you can really even see how large some of these tomatoes are because they're just popping right out of the screen. Um, observation being a big, big part of what we're doing and, uh, you know, the intent, uh, intent's a big part of permaculture for a lot of people. The, the mindset that you bring to the garden, I like to think that by observing and watching and uh, being in the mindset that I'm willing to learn, uh, helps helps the garden I, you know that's really a metaphysical type thing that a lot of people are gonna probably say bad things about but it helps me um, it helps me to see things that I wouldn't have seen uh, to show gratitude and in this day and age it's hard to show gratitude to something other than humans and not be ridiculed but uh, I like to say thank you to the plants that we put out here for putting up with uh, our crazy ideas uh, and, and rewarded with it, here's a tangerine tomato that's beginning to ripen. And those were just absolutely excellent plants. Uh, wonderful fruit. Here's a 21st uh, okra. You know, I, I've talked about okra before and how it's you can't not grow okra in the south. If you, if you kill okra, then your soil must be really terrible and you need... So, this soil is not great. Sure, there's organic fertilizer and there's mulch and everything, um, but you couldn't stop these okra plants from growing. They created a huge, huge uh, canopy, but it didn't stop the cosmos. Here's that cosmos plant that I've been talking about uh, being a meter across in the bottom right-hand corner of the picture. Temperatures in the shade, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius, just an insane. Um, deeper shade this may have been this was probably underneath the oak tree at right about 90 degrees so you can see why you'd want shade you know at least hit your plants with shade a little bit in the summer in our climate because they're not going to stand 100 degrees very long photosynthesis on a lot of plants shuts down uh, right after 100 degrees Fahrenheit so uh, shades you don't need 12 hours of sun for your tomatoes. We'll get we'll get to that at the end of this slideshow. Actually, very shortly here, um, showing you the humidity level. Yeah, this is a really cheap thermometer, and uh, it's it's not 100% accurate. This is not like a scientific measurement, but the um, the humidity percentage in the other pictures was really low. It was real dry. Um, a lot of days can, it can be really humid, and other days it can be super bone dry. But right on the pond, this is a couple of inches above the pond, sitting on water hyacinth, we've got normal humidity. So, showing you that ponds do regulate microclimates. Well, obviously, they should a few inches above their surface. But um, again, I wasn't conducting the most scientific experiment in the world. Here's a section of the garden that we are going to take over for next year. Uh, it's a south-facing berm, this huge slope uh, of, of just grass at this point. But in 2012, we took it over and sheep mulched it. And uh, I hear that now it's producing more squash than my family can eat. And we have a lot of perennials put in there as well. And here's what I was talking about with um, 
you know, there's the conventional lawn and then there's a the conventional garden. This is a garden for a church that's going to be donating the food to um, food banks. Laudable cause. Glad to see people doing it. I mean, they had an empty lot that they weren't doing anything with. So, you know, to see them growing something is wonderful. Um, but again, sometimes we get a little, uh, at least I get a little upset with the fact that people who do this, people who think that this is the way to garden, that this with these yellow plants all in a row, no companion planting, no mulching, no no water harvesting, bare soil. Um, in the wintertime, they don't do any cover cropping. Uh, just to have them tell me that what we're doing, that permaculture doesn't work, that this is the way you have to do it, that you have to pour chemicals on everything, I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, it, it, but I think by by now, even with that, fir that first season of gardening, uh, you can tell what's a healthier system. And here's another picture from theirs. Here's their tomatoes. You know, it's just, it, this is pure, this is treating land like it's um, some kind of mine that you can just, uh, you know, rip holes in it and start pulling out uh, whatever the heck you want to. You put your plants in and you're treating it like a production line. Uh, and and it's nice to see that they're growing food and donating it to um, food banks, but you know I had enough run-ins at my last job with people who thought that this was the only way and that uh, organic couldn't feed anybody, you couldn't do anything. And I, I think by showing you this photographic record that um, you know, that's just not the case whatsoever. Uh, we're going to end July with a photo of one of my last harvests before I went off to uh, Finland for the month of uh, August. So, I, you know, there won't be a slideshow for August. We don't have any pictures from August. Uh, but this is, I did one real quick harvest. I wanted to get as much in as I could. But this would, this is, you know, a typical, this would be a typical yield um, on a weekly basis even more than in this remember first year garden first year organic garden that doesn't have the soil right and people are telling me organic can't do anything um, it's just pathetic like, look how many of these cherry tomatoes there are look at how many of these other tomatoes we're getting from you know transplanted tomatoes uh, tomatoes that were bought on a whim because we like the description not because they're going to do well in our environment uh, this is just a basic showing of what's what is possible. So, um, the next slideshow will cover September when I come back from Europe, and uh, that might be coming out next week. And then remember the first week of uh, August, the end of July. You're not going to see any from you know this year currently. You're not going to be seeing any slideshows put up. Uh, we're having my wet my wedding is. Uh, on the 4th, so we've got family and friends from a few places in Europe and the States here in Finland, and we're, uh, you know, doing other things than making slideshows. So I hope that was worth listening to, and I hope you'll stay tuned for the sixth episode.